Um, I'm Josh. I talk a lot. I'm also the president of this whole weird bunch. So that gives me some excuse, I guess. <laughs> um, well, awesome. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm really excited to hear about Skylum. That's your cue. I don't know. Welcome. I appreciate y'all being here. This is awesome. <laughs> Great. It, it's a, um, <laughs> this is, um, you know, innovators, right. And people doing something different and making the industry take notice. Um, and so we're lucky to have them here to come talk to us. So I will shut up now and y'all go ahead and do your great, thing. Great. Well, you're, the main star of the show is uh, Mr. Benelli there, but uh, I'll give a few opening remarks. Uh, my name's Kevin. I'm uh, located in San Diego. Most of us are working remote, of course, uh, these days. Um, I've been with the company about eight years, and, and I have seen that us lean into that innovation over the last uh, eight years. We used to be a Mac-only software company. And uh, we were kind of following the traditional path of, of creating, you know, specific tools for specific uses, you know, denoising, erasing stuff, intensifying details. Um, got the bright idea at some point to kind of merge all those things together into a standalone product. Um, and we called it Luminar. Um, but Luminar has evolved as well. Uh, again, in the early days, the first few versions, we were very much um, like a lot of the plugins and traditional photo editing tools that you, that you guys are familiar with. And uh, I kind of liken it to, to the tool wars, right? Every, every upgrade cycle, you have to come up with some, some new stuff. And, and generally it's just a, a twist or a little extra um, thing that you may have seen in other applications. Um, you know, we get a lot of feedback from customers about what they want to see. But about, about 18 months ago, we, we decided to, to sort of start with a clean sheet of paper. So Luminar 4 is what I would call the last of our traditional photo editing tools. It's got some AI smarts in it, uh, actually some uh, quite nice tools in it. But Luminar AI kind of took a different approach. It was more focused on you know, results versus the process and how do you get to those end results as quickly as possible. Uh, Vanelli's going to give you a great demo. I don't want to steal his thunder. He's our director of education. Um, just from a housekeeping standpoint, I'll answer some questions uh, in the chat if you have them, if they're kind of utility level questions, but I'll, I'll certainly feed them to, to, to him and cut in every once in a while to make sure everybody gets their, uh, uh, gets their questions answered in a, an appropriate way. Um, so I guess without any further ado, uh, Vanelli, take it away, my friend. Hey guys, thank you so much for having me here. Um, and most of you I know from the Photoshop world days, we, we missed that to where we could all get together and just sit and talk. Um, a lot of times, especially like in the Vegas ones, um, Cabasi, myself and a few others would just find a spot, sit there and people would sit with us and ask us a ton of questions ranging from photography to photo editing to how to get new clients. Uh, what's going on in the industry so it was great now with zoom coming along that took that little group of people and oh man it just expanded to the masses and so out of something bad i feel came something good but you're still missing that one-on-one -on -one interaction with people so that's what i think we're missing and hopefully we'll get back to that real soon all right well let me dive in and share my screen and Kevin, do you see Luminar? Yep, okay. And you should see my presentation now. Right, perfect. All right, so um, here's what we're gonna do. What you're gonna learn today is understanding the role of AI, unique adjustments in Luminar AI, enhancing efficiency and creativity together, and then integrating Luminar AI into your existing workflow. And I can't stress that enough. Our goal isn't to replace Lightroom or Photoshop. If that's your uh, workflow and you're used to it, stick to what works for you. And then gradually take some of the tools that Lightroom doesn't have, that Luminar has very strong, and you'll apply it as a plugin. Things that take forever in Photoshop, like portrait retouching, is a breeze in Luminar. So if you're used to doing the majority of your work, starting in Lightroom, continue with that, use Luminar as a plugin, 
If you are ready to make the leap to where it's strictly a standalone program, you're able to do that too, all right? Now, Skylum was founded in 1998 with no outside capital, meaning they we control our own destiny. They have proven leadership. Uh, we have over 130 employees worldwide. We have a very strong R&D, engineering, and QA teams of over 60 people focusing on innovation. And of course, we have a huge global community of photographers and the, and the program comes in 11 languages. Now, why Luminar? Especially Luminar AI. It's the first image editor fully powered by artificial intelligence. And I'll show you how that equates to what we're doing. Traditional photo editing is outdated and slow. I can't say how many times we headbutt with the engineers, like, why are we doing it like this? We're used to doing it like this. And then <laughs> they win. And all of a sudden you see what they did. You're like, oh, that makes sense now. And it's really cool where their vision, um, where their vision is. Uh, create mind-blowing photos in less time. And our goal is to focus on results, not on the process. Uh, my, my goddaughter called the other day. She's taking a Photoshop class. And the traditional A, B, C, we had to go through all the steps. And she said, Uncle Rob, where do I download the grunge brush? I'm like, what the heck, the grunge brush? You know, so, you know, it's one of those things. If you don't have that grunge brush, the rest of the tutorial is not going to work. So it took us a good 15 to 20 minutes to find the brush the teacher called grunge brush. I mean, there's a million, a million of them. She didn't explain it properly, but that's traditional editing where it's linear. Whereas Luma, you can start anywhere. It doesn't matter where you start, you'll end up in the same spot. All right, now we're gonna go through some of our tools that are for landscape and travel, which from hearing uh, what Josh said is kind of the bulk of the group. There's atmosphere AI, structure AI. Um, there are tools in here. Of course, you can replace clouds or replace the sky with it. Um, enhance the color harmony. Uh, the super contrast tool, you're absolutely gonna love because you're able to focus on the highlights, the midtones, and the shadows. So for those that are extremely controlling, a lot of these AI tools also have the advanced sections of the tool to let you take control. It, it, it's much like a Tesla. Now people think Tesla drives themselves, well they do to a point. You still have to be in the car. You still have to take control over it. And then for the portrait people, body AI, which is phenomenal since COVID came. Um, I, did, I did one on me. I showed my son. This was me before COVID, and then it shrunk my body, me after COVID. And so uh, my kid looked at that and thought, yeah, you must love Luminar now. Um, we could change the colors of the eyes and enhance the eyes. The face AI you're absolutely going to fall in love with. It does everything with the face with sliders, which means you can create templates with it. And it's intelligent enough to know the next image is a different face. So it takes your suggestions and applies them a proper, properly to the next image. Accent AI is going to be our best friend. That's going to improve color, detail, tone, and depth of an image. And coming in 2021 is Bokeh AI. All right, so let's see what AI can do. Let me get into Luminar. All right, so I'm gonna start, because you guys are a bunch of landscape photographers, let, let's start with this landscape here. Now, I mentioned that Luminar, the, the roots of it is AI. Now, we could just jump right into the edit panel and start doing all of our editing here, but if you really wanna take full benefit out of the AI technology, you start with templates. And what's really cool about this is it automatically analyzes the image. And it notices there's water in the scene. There's, land, there's a landscape in the scene. So it gives you suggestions on what it feels, what templates would be good. How, how many Lightroom presets do you have? and you have to go through a million of them to find the one you want. Here, we have the, the, the built-in ones 
we went painstakingly through and taught it how to analyze the image. So I can look at water and let's say I come down here and one click, look at this, before and after. You'll see up in here, if this is changing color, it's, um, it's processing it. Let's go to cold. Oh, I like that one too. Before, after, I'm just hitting the visibility icon. If I don't like these templates, I can come over here. And what's neat about all this, by the way, is once I apply a template, it automatically overwrites all the other ones for me. So like in Lightroom, for example, I did this the other day. I hit a preset. It put it on. Well, I went to another one. Well, it added to what I just did. Hello? And if you, you keep doing that over and over again, yeah. eventually it muddies Hello? it up. So um, I like this one right here, uh, dynamic results. So before, after. I mean, these are things you would do on your own. So let's see what it did. If I hit edit, I come over here to the tools. I go to the very top. Now, what's neat about the tools is they're broken down into segments. You have essential tools. So these are the, the most common tools we photographers are going to use. This is our digital darkroom. Then if we want to get creative, here are our creative tools. Portrait tools. And then the professional tools where you want more control over what we're doing. So I'm going to come up here. The Enhance AI, right, Accent AI, that is going to be your best friend. And like I said, that one tool automatically improves color, detail, tone, and depth. That took over this tool here. You've seen this in Lightroom. So this is one of the, quote, traditional tools. And we kept it because our customers are asking for it. They want this. That one little tool up here took, took over all of these tools here, all right, or settings. If I come down again, notice I'm noticing a little dot. So on this dot here, Structure AI, this is one of those human-aware um, tools. If I had a person in the scene, it would know that there's a person, and it doesn't affect the skin tones. It'll make everything around you sharp, but if there's a person there, it respects the skin tones and it doesn't over um, add structure to the skin. And I'm gonna go to an extreme just to show you. So here's an extreme. And if you want more of that HDR look, you could boost it up here. So that right there, you could look at that as a de detail. We have details down here. You can look at it as another tool for details. Now, the difference is with Structure AI, any of the AI tools, I give it an amount, let's say 47. Now, the cool thing about this is it says, all right, which structure we're going to look at all the dark pixels, all the bright pixels, we're going to measure them, and we're going to enhance them. So it gives the appearance of it being sharper. That's what it's really doing. Well, I put 47 down. So if the, ne the next image comes along and I apply this template to that image, it'll analyze the image and it'll say, all right, 47 was the strength that he went up to. However, this particular image doesn't need that much um, enhancement. So it knows enough what it needs based on that 47 and it'll go up to that 47 to make the image look great. Details, on the other hand, is more of the traditional tools. So let me just crank it all the way up. I'm going to go overboard. All right, so I totally went overboard sharpening this. So on the next image, if it doesn't need sharpening, it'll do it no matter what. Because with the traditional tools over here, it takes those numbers and it applies it to the next image. Even if the image doesn't need it, it'll still apply it. That's where the AI tools come in handy because they analyze it for you and apply it. All right, now here's the atmosphere AI. We're gonna add some fog to this scene. 
but we're going to layer the fog. Now watch close. I'm going to give the amount 100%. Notice where it is, right over here. It's using 3D rendering. Look at that. So it's bringing the fog across. So it's bringing the fog into the scene. Now, rule of thumb, this right here looks good with the fog because there's already fog up here in the scene. You know, if I tried to apply this, let's say, uh, Josh, we're doing a concert photo shoot, and I tried to apply the fog onto the person up in the concert, it's going to look totally fake because it's not, it's, it's not meant to be there. It's like adding a night sky to a daylight photo. You know, we have to know when to place the proper tools. But with, with, um, with the Atmosphere AI, look at this, before and after. I mean, to me, I just think that's incredible. Now, so that, that's our part of our AI technology. Now, I'm going to come down to that super contrast I talked about. So I could focus strictly, look at this, just on the highlights and then balance the highlights, midtones. There we go. And then shadows. Look at that. That's kind of a one stop shop in and of itself. <laughs> I love that. Exactly. Tool. And hey, V, uh, um, I did get a question from, from Berlin about um, the templates and whether you can stack templates or whether there's a, a, a way to use multiple templates on a single image. Yeah. So on that, you wouldn't want to. Um, and, and I'll tell you why, the, the templates are designed to make, so now I created this look out of this template. I can always come back and let's say, well, you saw what I just did. So we, we changed the, the original template was the, the dynamic result one. So instead of stacking another template on top of that, we can add more tools to this. Now from here, I can come down, save it, and then over here is where my tools or my templates are saved. Here's what we just created. I'm going to rename it. Um, let's say dynamic results. I'm going to leave it version two. So now I knew, now I, I know I used a base. I used a preset template as a base. However, I'm adding my own twist to it. Now I just made that my own template. Now I made that mine. If I were to send that off to somebody, any tool that I've used in this, the settings, even let's say if I replace clouds or if um, I added, like say, birds to the scene, all of that goes with it. So you don't have to hunt for them. All right. So that was one question. Um, do you need a fast computer? So the answer to that, of course, with everything is, why not? Um, we do have on the website, if you look, which is really cool, here, help, user guide. Oh, that user guide is where, that right there, I'm only saying because we're the ones who wrote it and, and developed it. That right there is where you're going to find all your answers. So the goal is for you to never have to call support you call support when something doesn't work, not how to. So with the user guide here, I'm going to click on it for now, but you click on it and it gives you every setting that you're working on. It tells you what it's doing. If you are wondering, well, with the templates, um, how do I save my templates or where are my templates stored? All the information is right there in that template and it's living it's a living, breathing document, meaning that I could change it or we could change it on the fly. We could add videos to it. If we wrote something that you don't understand and somebody says, hey, I really don't quite understand where, where this is heading, we could rewrite it on the fly and it's right there built into your software. All right. Yeah, and, and and I'll uh, I'll add that, you know, of course, it's searchable and, and all that. But if the term blood, sweat and tears means anything <laughs> to anybody on the call, 
that user manual has a lot of blood, sweat, and tears from that man right there. <laughs> um, it, it was fun. It, I shouldn't say it was fun. It was um, it was definitely a challenge, but now that it's done from an education standpoint, I can see where a lot of the instructors can easily reference that right away and give the answers to their students. So in there, yes, it tells you exactly what you need for your system requirements, the minimum, maximum. If you have 16 gigs of RAM, you're doing very well. I mean, like an i7, you'll be fine. So yeah, don't worry about that. Um, where was the other question? Oh, Kevin, thank you. Kevin put the link in there to, to where it is. Good, and that's it. All right, great. All right, let me get on to the next one. Go back to the catalog. All right, so let me come back here for a minute. And let's do, okay, got it right here. I'm gonna jump right into um, enhancing eyes, uh, enhancing eyes with AI with no masking, all right? This I absolutely love. Uh, Josh, you're gonna go nuts over this. And actually, uh, I will use her. Um, her. Her eyes are a little bit darker. Got it. It's before and after. Good, we didn't enhance it yet. All right, so instead of jump, well, I can jump into the templates, which I will, and let it come up with one. And sure enough, it's gonna come up with some suggestions. Let's say I did this one. Give it a second. And again, you'll see this right up here, illuminating. That's a nostalgic one. I'm not a fan of the, too much of the, the, the grit. Yeah, so, oh, so this is film, no wonder. So that was under the film, the film collection. I'm gonna come over. Here's some experimental stuff. Zoom out. Give it a second. Look at that. So before, after, let's see a little glowing effect. All right. So I like all of it, but let's say this is not my cup of tea. So what I can do is come down to the portrait tools. Here's easy portrait, tack sharp. I'm going to click on that. And again, if you see this illuminating, it means it's processing it. All right, there we go. Ready? Before, after, so we're off to a good start. Now let's go to the edit panel. And I'm going to jump down to portrait. And here's face. Now from here, eyes. I can enhance the eyes just with one slider. And look what it, you see the movement with it. And I can even bring a little flare into the eyes. Now she has darker eyes. So before and after, you're gonna see the change, but not as drastic as you would with somebody with blue, or blue eyes. But look at that, before, after, and then let's see, you can come down. We can enhance the mouth, the teeth, and here, this is so cool, watch this. It knows right where the face is. So if, let's say I'm photographing and I forget to bring a reflector or bounce some light into the person's face, this is a good time where we could use um, the face light. Normally I'd have an intern or an assistant off to either camera left or right, bouncing a reflector into the subject's face. So I had that separation. Well, if you don't have that, then you're able to um, uh, bounce it using the face AI tool. Let me come back in here and I'll answer the questions in just a moment. Let's grab, I'm gonna come back up here for a second. And let's see. All right, Kevin, what I'm gonna to try to grab is another image. Hey, hey, hey V, yep. while you're there, uh, Josh asked uh, if you can 
apply the settings that you just uh, applied to that young lady on multiple images. Okay. And so since so, you're browsing her catalog so here, yeah, you why might want to try that. So, so I have her here, right? Um, to kind of finish this off a bit. Well, you know what? This really, thanks, thanks for bringing that in. All right, so to finish this off, and again, you can see it working. I'm going to use the vignette tool. Now, the uniqueness about this vignette tool is I can tell it where the center point is. I'm going to go to an extreme so you can see it. Look at this. So I could choose where I want that center point to be. So if I want it right here, I can come in, adjust the roundness of it, and then feather the daylights out of it. Good. And once I have it set, then I'm going to dial back some of the amount, because if a person looks at this and says, wow, that's a great vignette, obviously you went too far. Um, so you wanna make it to where it's drawing attention to her. And if I need to, ready for this, look at this. I can add inner light to her. So now when we look at it, it's before and after. So we like where that's at and let me just jump up one more. Good. I like that right there. All right. So now that let's say we have this set, we could come down here and save it as our own template. Or what we can do, you see how this has the luminar blue around it? I'm using the shift key and I'm just selecting these images here. Right click, adjustments synchronize so now this right here that has the that's highlighted it'll apply the same adjustments all the way across the images now i'm going to control z it for this particular image i'm going to stay right where it's at this will give it more of a dramatic look to it i love everything we did with it however i do want to make it black and white now if i use the template with all the changes we made here, it's gonna overwrite the template. But the cool thing about Luminar is it's non-destructive. So if I click on the history tool, everything we've done is shown up here. So at any point, I can go right back to the original or let's say before the vignette, or I can stop it right before that vignette tool is applied, or I can take it all the way back to the very beginning. So the history tool is very powerful that it makes sure that we keep the image as clean as possible to where if we decide to go back and re-edit it, we have that option. So I'm gonna to come to black and white, one click, go oh, look at that, I like it. Catalog. When I'm pressing control, or I'm sorry, um, deselect. There we go. I'm pressing control A to select all of them, all the images. And because this is highlighted, right click, adjustment, synchronize. And now the rest of them will be converted to black and white to match this. All right, so that's how we that's how we um, nice can apply a mass or one one of the templates that we've edited. We yeah, can apply it to a batch process. Wait, I'm watching a, a a Zoom thing on photography. Say it again, please. So can I call you later? Okay, off the bank. Oh, <laughs> that wasn't for me. Okay, so. <laughs> Let me get back to back to here. Um, now you guys have already seen this in other apps. Uh, let's see. And again, so so I'm going to go right right straight to the tool, just to show you where it's at. So here here's our composition AI. Now, what's neat about composition AI is I have the option 
when I click it, for it to apply a crop for me. So it's going to look at this and say, okay, well, what is the most relevant part of the, of the image? And it does a really good job at cropping it, you know, for me. I can double click and accept its crop. Once I do, I can come back. And in this case here, here's the perspective. I can click on that. And sometimes I'll look at an image and I think it's straight. And I'll just click whip, uh, the perspective and it automatically straightens it for me. And I look and oh yeah, that's right, it was off. That, that's just my way of checking to make sure. You heard that, judges, AI cropping. <laughs> so um, I'm going to come back again. And I'm sorry, the reason why I'm laughing is we, we, we worked with another group that were visually impaired. They, they were close, they were blind. And I made a comment, yeah, sometimes when I'm out shooting, I have a hard time with the horizon line. Sometimes it's crooked. And the guy jokingly said, yeah, how do you think we feel? And it went right over my head. I had no, it didn't, I didn't even think about it until the very end of the uh, presentation. And I realized why he thought that was the funniest thing ever. But yes, so here we are with the composition AI. One click, and there we are, it straightens it out. All right, so we have that set. We go back to the here. Um, hey, 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 Vanelli, we, we did have a question um, from uh, Jim. He was asking, do the sharpening and noise reduction functions in Luminar AI eliminate the need for separate sharpen AI and noise reduction AI programs? Uh, I'm pretty sure he's talking about the Topaz. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, keep in mind, you, okay, me personally, and again, it's not because I work for Skylum, an AI sky replacement is so much faster and easier, in my opinion, in Luminar than it is in Photoshop. When it comes to a painting effect, I could do some painting in Luminar, but not. it's not meant to do that. I use texture overlays. I would use Topaz Paint to paint my images. So you have to look at it from the perspective of you being a carpenter. How many hammers does a carpenter really have? He just doesn't have one size fits all. You have to decide which image or which works best for you. Sometimes you'll, you'll love the results that we have here. Sometimes you'll love the results that maybe Topaz has. But again, those are tools that are at your disposal. All right. Yeah, and I, I would I would just jump in uh, a little bit and, you know, they're not necessarily an apples to apples comparison. You know, our, our structure AI, uh, which is human aware and it has a, a few other smarts to it. it it's not, even though the, the end result appears to be sharpening, it's actually a different technique than the traditional sharpening tools. Exactly. Um, the noise reduction AI, our noise reduction is not AI powered. That's not one of the tools that we, we chose to kind of infuse with uh, machine learning. Uh, so if the Topaz tool works, uh, works fine for you, uh, you know, use that. I, I think uh, things like eliminating the need for, those are, those are pretty definitive statements and, and I would never go on record as, as uh, you know, gee, I'm the sales guy and I'm saying that, what am I saying? No, what I'm saying is, you know, there's a tool as in your kit for everything. Yeah, you know? and remember, we're all photographers first. First and foremost, and that's what I love about the CEO and um, Dima, who's the co-founder and the developer, along with uh, Ivan, they're all avid photographers. A lot of the skies you see, Dima actually took. Um, and and when, when you're with these guys, they always have their camera with them, and, and they're, they're, have, they have a thirst for knowledge with photography. Um, and I'll show you a little bit later on how you can replace the color of an eye. Well, they were watching one of my demos, and I showed how you can replace the color of an eye by painting in a color effect. And they said, oh, no, no, that goes against everything we teach. We don't want you to have to paint something in. Let's create a slider for it. And boom, we have Iris AI to where you can change the eyes. And I think it's the coolest thing ever. So not only do they have the brains 
but they also have the vision and listening um, to the things that we need. All right. All right, Kevin, since again, the, these guys are a group of um, landscape. Let's see. All right. Sorry, Josh. <laughs> so here's easy landscape, scenic and water. Right, let's go to scenic for a moment. And here's a fast fix. Look at that. For, after, uh, let's say simple. Well, that's nice too. How about a pleasing touch? Mm, that was nice. Good. So after a while, you'll start to use some of these templates. Oh, like clean life, for example. Not on this one. Sunset. For stream. Oh, so I'm going to go back to the one I, I liked earlier here, Fast Fix. All right. So I may click the heart icon, and now that's one of my favorites, and it'll appear right over here as one of my favorites. So now I can come back in and start my, my edits with my favorites. All right. Clean light usually work, but for this image, not quite sure why it didn't, but I'll stick with fast fix. Here's that it. And I know, actually AI, look at this. I know it needs a huge boost of it. And so if I were looking at this image, I know Josh, you and I like, <laughs> as a portrait photographer, I hate to say this, we're, we're kind of, um, we're kind of blessed to be able to shoot in the studio and tether it to a computer and you take a picture, you look at the computer, if you don't like the results, we reset the scene. Unfortunately, you could carry that stuff with you, but I'm sure if you're hiking up all this, these mountains, after a while that, that heavy laptop is gonna be a nuisance. So in this, for this particular image, I'm gonna come back to the catalog for a moment and look at the raw. So that was shot ISO 200. 16 millimeter, 4.5 at 1, 125th of a second. So in this case here, I probably would have boot, I probably would have bumped it up to like 400 ISO just because it appeared a little bit too dark. So that's something we would fix in camera. But since we didn't, we could fix it here. Now, while I'm at it, I can come back over here. And I can try to adjust the, the sky enhancer here. If it's not doing it for me, that's when I'll come down to, down to AI or sky AI. And I can select my favorite sky. Now, this is where you guys being part of a photo group, well, that's way too much. You guys have to decide, you know, are you going to allow somebody to replace the sky or does the sky have to be their sky you know is it something they took or is it something like obviously that's a total fake so you have to look at, at what we're doing and seeing what actually matches this scene you go sunset uh... <clears throat> Let's see. And, and for you, uh, event photographers, or wedding photographers, exactly. uh, you, you know, sometimes you you might be in a situation where everything's perfect except for the sky. A real estate is a great example. Do you exactly. want to show the, the house image with the, the gray sky and it's all dark or do you want it to be on a sunny day? And what a lot of photographers we talk to do is they'll go out to that same location and take a nat very natural but pleasing sky image there and they'll use that to replace the sky so it's not a it's not a sky image that's taken in norway or you know wherever it's it's a sky image from that very same location just on a different day so okay. you know your mileage may vary your your moral compass may may tilt one way or the other but um you know we're giving you the tools to to, to do it and Josh did say the general rule is taking the same location by the same camera, time notwithstanding. All right. Oh, okay. And Excellent. Ber Ber <laughs> on, Berlin, yes. that's what kids are for, for the, <laughs> for the gear schlepping. 
Um, um, okay, so if I do come over to light, you can use the camera profile. And, and I do know, notice that these do make a huge difference. So this was shot with a, uh, a Canon uh, 5D, let's see, camera faithful. Okay, that's pretty cool. So from here, like I said, we went from this kind of a dreary day to something like this. And I again, I can continue with my editing free, freelancing here, picking the different tools to bring out what I feel the image should look like. And again, I, all of that is subjective. I do want to come over here and show you. Oh, perfect, perfect. All right. So here's an image with a girl on the rock. Now, Kevin and I took this shot in Las Vegas. You don't see Kevin, but Kevin, let, let it illuminate. Kevin is way in the background, and there was a flock of these birds. And I yelled, Kevin, cue the birds. Kevin ran through the birds. The birds jumped up. I yelled to her, action, and she acted like she was reaching for it. I can't tell you how many people believe that. So, so that's where, when is it okay to add stuff like the augmented series? When is it okay to add that stuff? You know, maybe not for competition, unless it's a creative competition, but what if this were a wedding and there's a bride and groom and it looks like the bride and groom are commanding the birds? That's a cool feeling. It tells a story. But as photographers, we have to know when it's real or when, when it's Memorex. Um, no, we have to know when it's real or when we know we can add stuff here to it. Now, I did add the birds to the sky. Um, but you know what I want to do is let me, let me start from the original. And actually, I want to see something. I want to some... Okay, go to same. So I'm going to go to the folder with the images. So I like that one quite a bit. Let's see. Let's take hey, a v, while, while we're waiting for that to load, um, we had a we had a question from Clay about uh, naming files to keep modifications to a single image organized. Okay. And, yep, and just in general, how do we, can you explain how the folders and catalogs work? You're, you're going uh, to love, love, like love okay. what I'm about to tell you with that. All right. So let me come up here a little more. I'm looking at, so this is a nice, um, uh, this photographer uh, did a really good job at capturing a good set of images. All right. Let's see. Um, here, I think she's acting like a bird. Let's let it render. And if you're noticing some of the lag, you know, we're, we're pushing the, the computer to its limits, you know, making sure, there we go, making sure we're able to broadcast and run the program. Let's see, here she is dancing. All right, that's what I like. All right, so let's start with this one here. Now, from here, I'm, uh, I, could, I can start with the cropping first and then going into our routine. What I wanna show you is it doesn't make a difference where you begin. Because let's, let's say, like in Photoshop, if you came in and you started with the cropping first, and let's say we don't want this to be portrait we want this to be um a landscape shot so i locked it in now i cropped it the way i like it i come over to the template and let's see what the suggestions it's giving us let's see blockbuster Ooh, teal and orange. Oh, yeah, teal and orange looks pretty good. And by the way, if this is too aggressive for you, you can always come down here, look at this, and dial in the amount, and it'll adjust all of them at the same um, level. I'm going to leave it here for now. 
All right, so I like where that's at. Let's say um, we're going to come over. We'll do that vignette again. I, <clears throat> it it, hey, B, th yes? th that amount, that amount I, don't, I don't want this to go and said that amount slider down at the bottom where he could uh, dial in the effect to, to taste. Uh, I think that's one of the unsung heroes of the, of the program. Yes. A lot of times uh, we, we do get customer comments that are, that our templates or our presets are, are overcooked or they're, they're over the top. And that's because we're trying to make something that works across the widest range of images. Um, once we teach people about the amount slider, it's, it's a game changer because those, those templates that were once, oh, that's way too much, now become you know, at 75% just perfect. And so that's been kind of a philosophy of the, of the engineering team you know, uh, since, since we started Luminar. Yeah. I mean, how, how many times have you, you, you did something late at night? Like, oh man, God, that's incredible. You go to bed, you wake up the next morning, you look at it and you're like, oh my God, what the heck was I thinking? You dial it back 15 to 20%. You're like, oh, that looks good now. Um, so that, that's what that feature down there is really good at. Well, right, and so we and it this... doesn't, and, and it doesn't actually only work for templates. <clears throat> Imagine following down a workflow of multiple edits on an image uh, and, and every one of them looks good, but additive, they are maybe a little over the top. Again, very easy to move that, that slider back. Uh, so it's not only for templates, even if you went straight to the editing module, you could still exactly. dial that, that back and it dials things back proportionally. Okay. All right. So and now here, like we said, we can bring out the shadows mid-tones and of course the highlights all independently we have that with super contrast here now um i had oh i know what it was all right so now what i'm going to do is this i want this bottom half to be darker than the top half so here's where the local masking comes in i'm going to add a basic mask to this and let's say we bring down the exposure now this is a global change it's going to make everything it's affecting the entire image that's okay for now all i care about is these rocks down in here well now i can come over here to the mask make sure i have erase or paint i'm going to use paint and let's do a gradient mask i'm just going to draw the ground up so wherever you see red that's the mask itself so that's painting the effect onto the scene and there i have it let's see if i can show before here we go i can turn it on turn it off and what's really cool is every tool i should take that back the majority of the tools have that layer mask on it so the majority of the tools have it to where you could decide if you want to apply um, a mask in that area all right so now that we have this set, let's go to the augmented sky. And here we are. And I'm, I'm going to just stick with those birds. So here's a set of birds, small. Uh, let's do two. Okay. And then number one must be like the massive ones. And did I select it? You still doing it? Up oh, there, the other way up there. Let's bring it down. Here we are. And I can enlarge them. So I can make the birds look like they're closer to the subject by making them look larger or smaller by making them away. Now, we talked about the masking. It does a really good job at knowing there's a person here. However, sometimes like this right here, as good as it is, it may get caught up. Well, this is where you can do that mask again. I want to erase at 100% opacity. Let's say it's all around her. 
So it's it's going to erase these birds here on her arm, and let's say down here. And when I zoom out, boom, there we are. All right. So you see how we can add augmented, make this augmented reality, but you have the option of resizing it. And of course, masking it in or masking it out. And there we have it here. But all the tools, once we start adding them in, have those in there. All right. So we have that. We'll I could just uh, interject a, a little yeah. editorial comment. I think the the ability for every tool to have its own mask is is again one of those nuances, those unheralded killer features. Um, you know, you know, instead of relying on a thousand layers in Photoshop to do every little thing you want to do, with with Luminar, it's so direct and easy. Oh, I want to sharpen that. You just grab the sh grab the sharpen tool or the structure tool and and paint it in where you want. Oh, I want this part of the image that maybe the background to have film grain. Great, apply the film grain. You can do radials, you can do gradients, or you can do freeform painting. But the ability to do, to apply that for each tool is ridiculously powerful and not obvious. <laughs> it's like, once you kind of grok it, you'll use it all the time. Um, but until then you're like, well, you know, why don't we have this or why don't we have that? But man, once you get that, that concept, you'll be using it for selective editing, you know, till the cows come home. All right. Now that, that brings us up to using it as a Photoshop or a Lightroom plugin. All right. So here's a good example. Uh, let, let's say Kevin and I go out and we photograph, um, let's say we're in the Grand Canyon. And we decided that we want to make each of these um, uh, post posters telling us exactly where we were. There we go. Like this one right here. View from wherever we were. All right. Or if you want, see, this right here is the same size. If you go too far right here. Yeah. Well, let me get to that. There it goes. So this right here. I believe it's a 16 by 24. So it's a 16 by 24 print. And if this, if you wanted to use it for competition, it gives you enough to where you could touch the, the edges without damaging the, the print itself. So let me just show you how I used Photoshop to create this. Right click. I want to show in my Explorer. Here it is. Right click and open with. Photoshop. So that's my way of using Luminar as a visual browser. So now I know where my stuff is. I'm going to bring it in, let it open up into Photoshop. I should have Photoshop open earlier. And this is the part that's pretty cool. All right. So let me shut this down. So this is how I created it, made a 16 by 24 print because I wanted this the inside to be a two thirds. So right out of the camera, the dimensions are exactly what you want. So with Windows, let me hide the, I want to hide the, um, um, the, the ruler and the grid, the grid. Options. Hey, where is that? Oh, view. So under view, don't show the extras. All right. And if you notice, I have a, a really cool little silver border going all the way around. All right. Now, I'm going to hide that. And this right here, that was a final print. This right here is a smart object. And the smart object is going to make us be able to use this as a smart filter. So this right here, so if I were to shut everything off, you would see that's what I'm left with. All right. So we made that into a smart filter or smart object. If I double click on it, now it opens up my image. This is where Luminar has been added. All right. So Luminar has been added to this. 
I clicked on it so it's going to have to run Luminar again. It'll go out to Luminar, find the settings that I added, added them to it, and bring it into here. So let's give it a couple seconds for that. That's one thing I don't like about Photoshop's smart um, objects and the smart filters is if you make a change to that filter, if I turn it on and turn it off, it has to re-render itself. So boom, it takes my changes I made, applies it, boom, pulls it back in. Now, what if I want to change that image? Right click, I want to replace, replace the contents. And we're going to come over here. Under my photography, let's see, I believe I put it under, I did this last time too, Kevin, didn't I? Coffee shop, here it is, Luminar is a plug-in, and I absolutely love, love, love this image that was taken by Mark, and I got this from Unsplash, and now I place it in. Now, since I replaced it, it's going to run Luminar for me. I don't have to remember which plugin or template I used. I don't have to remember any of the settings. It's going to do it automatically for me because I saved it as a smart um, filter. It goes in, checks it out, applies all my settings to it. And then, boom, it comes right back in. Just to be clear, V, you don't have to click the apply button there in the upper nope. right, right? Exactly. So if you were if you were using this as a plugin, then of course you hit apply just like you do with all the other ones. Here, because we're using it as a template, I don't have to. Now I'm gonna resize this. Now, unfortunately, since I resized it, you guess what's gonna happen? It's gonna run the it's gonna run the filter, it's gonna run it again. Um Typically, I had that set ahead of time, but it's going to run Luminar again and do the routine. While it's doing that, Clay asked, what system am I using? <laughs> I'm fortunate, Kevin, to get, to get the Surface, Microsoft Surface Studio. Can you guys see this? Accounting was using it. Why would accounting use this, <laughs> this incredible piece of um, gear? So... After finagling with Mandy, I got to take this over. This does have 32 gigs of, of, of memory. It doesn't have a dedicated graphics card. And I found out later that really it is a very powerful laptop. So it's borderline desktop laptop. So it, it is, I could run Adobe Premiere. Um, I could run a lot of different software with it. It's not as fast as a desktop, but I like how fast Luminar is going with it. All right? So, <laughs> hey, us accountants love computers. So, notice how it saved it. Now, watch this. Here, the old image is still there. But the moment I hit Control-S or save it, when I come back, boom, it replaced it, and everything looks identical. So, if we had a dozen of these, because Kevin made me stop each of the way to shoot. We have 12 beautiful shots. You can put up, you can put them around um, one centerpiece, and that could be your trip to Yosemite. All right. So, <laughs> all right. So that's again how you could use Photoshop with Luminar. Right, any questions on that before I close it? <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> you can make a bunch of the demotivational photos quickly. Yes. And my that favorite this down before he destroys it. All right. My my favorite one is the uh, is the bear in the middle of the stream, and the salmon is jumping right into his mouth, and it says, "Sometimes a journey of a thousand miles ends very badly." <laughs> <laughs> Kevin. All right. Um, you know what? While I got you guys here, here we are with the portrait. Um, 
I'm going to go off script a little bit, Kevin. And I, I, I can hear you. Say, I love oh, it no. when you do that. I love it when you and do that. Only because I've been working on this all day, not all day, but this is one of the, the images I worked with earlier today. Now let's make sure I have it. Yeah, this is, this is probably a good time to plug uh, the coffee break. If, if you guys uh, know Vanelli, you know, he's an, uh, he's an energy monster and twice a day, we do these uh, these short 15 to 20 minute coffee breaks. Uh, one on on YouTube as a live stream, and one on Facebook. And uh, Vanelli, along with her other educator um, Angela, uh, just put out tips and tricks on how to use Luminar effectively. It's completely free. It's fun to log into and uh, check out. I do it a lot. Um, but if you see the term coffee break. That's usually uh, got either Benelli or Angela's name behind it. And they're really fun to watch if you get a chance. Thank you, Kevin. All right, so this was my very first shoot with a model. Well, this is one of her sh first shoots too, uh, uh, Wendy. I love this shot here. Yes, she has one green eye and one blue eye. Now, if we were to photograph her, let's say, uh, and you're gonna see both eyes, I would either opt to buy contacts to make it match. Um, if I don't have it, I'll show you how we can fix it. So let's check this out real quick. I'm gonna do a real quick edit. Uh, Blockbuster, um, you know what, let's see. Let's see Teal and Orange, okay, that looks good. I like Teal and Orange with her there. I actually like that a lot. Now I'm gonna come over to the edit and I don't have to be precise, but I wanna be. Just because I want to show you this. Here's that face we talked about the AI. I could, which she doesn't need. I could slim her face in, but I like where her face is now. There's the light. Here's the eye enhancer. Now look what's really cool about this. You see that? Let me go a little closer. It knows it's going inside the hair. Look at that. That's number one. If she had a lot of dark patches under her eyes, look at that. I can bring that out a little bit. Here's what we may need to do. Let's change her eyes to green. Look at that. And I can bring it back or keep it full. Uh, let's come underneath. And I want to add a little lens flare under her eye. Look at that. Now, this eye here is looking a little, a little strange. Well, both of them are now, because that lens flare. Get them up there. Good visibility, right about there. So I'm looking at this, and because, now zoom it out, there we go. That looks good. And because of the way this is shaped, I could come in and use that brush at let's say 10% opacity, or 15 and just erase a little bit of it. Now it looks good. All right, so we have that set, but that's not what I wanted to show. So I, I wanted to show you how we could do all of this, but let me get back to that skin, which in a moment, really don't need to do it, but I wanna show you where it's at. Good. So now I have this set. Here's what's really cool about this local masking. I wanna add texture to this. So I'm going to load a texture, and I typically have a folder in my in my pictures folder called underscore assets because that shoots it right to the top. And then from here, I have a bunch of textures. And let's see the one I added. Here we go. Rough texture. Now we're going to take that. Let's just put it to 100%. 100%. So this is what we're really seeing, right? If I click on the advanced tool, I want to desaturate just a little bit. Good, I like where all that's looking. Now, I can come over here and use an overlay. So if I use soft light, here's hard light. Here's soft light, let's use soft light. Look at the painterly effect I'm getting from the side. However, I don't want it all the way on her face like this. 
So what we're going to do is bring it back to zero. I know I don't want zero. Let's say right about 70%. All right, I like about 70%. So I can come in here, erase, set the opacity. Let's see, 70%. I bet you should have been 30%. Yes, I was right. So it should have been 30%. So let me just paint back in some of that here. There we go. So now I can go in, and if I don't like, like this texture right here is a little too strong for me, I want to erase it, and, and, and I just... And by the way, if you see that's why I'm going to use the pen. That's when um, these these drawing tablets come in. Ooh, I like it like that. All right, now I have it set. I can come back and continue to add. Do you remember we we, we talked about uh, structure AI being human aware? Well, it's not going to affect the skin it's going to affect the texture around her. Look at that. Boost it up just a little bit. And now I just created a painterly effect without having to go through an actual paint. There we go. And then feather it a bit. And there we have it. That's super cool. I was about to say, Kevin, you haven't seen this one yet, did you, Kevin? <laughs> no, I, I just I put something in the chat that you're really off script. <laughs> I love no, it. <laughs> I we are before and after. I mean, how cool is that? And and again, it's something I, I did this for her, and she ended up putting it. I made it. Epson gave me good shout out to Epson. Thank you. A long time ago, Epson gave me their huge 9800 printer. That thing was incredible. Yes, he gave it to me for free, but it was like $700 to replace all the inks whenever it ran out. So it was very costly. So I, with their permission, I donated it to a local school and gave them a year's supply of ink, and the posters they made were phenomenal. But I made this into a 24 by 36 and printed on that, all, like the velvet paper that, that looked real, almost like metal. And she just absolutely loved that. And that was our very first shoot that we did together. And we went on to do a ton of shoots um, afterwards. But that's a good example of how we could use our creativity with efficiency. So, I mean, how hard was that? You saw what we just did. It's a simple texture overlay. Bip, there it is. Now, would Topaz take this to a totally different level for painting? Yes, it would. So that's where you decide when do you use a tool like that? When do you use a tool like this? To me, this was a quick no-brainer. Boom, done. Um, you know, and, and I like where it was at. Now, one other thing I mentioned. Let me add another. Now, notice what I'm doing here. I snuck this in on you. There's three ways to use Luminar. As you've been seeing me use it as a standalone program, to where I can add, here's a catalog of images. I can add a bunch of, a folder of images. Now, what's cool about that, and somebody asked earlier, oh, we'll use a little olive here. Let me reset it. Revert to original. This was a rescue kitten that we took in. All right. Now, look at the name down here. Well, if I right click and I say show in Explorer, it's gonna bring it up and here it is. I'm gonna keep the name, I'm gonna just keep that name as is for now, but I am gonna put Olive. Enter. Oh. <laughs> okay, because I'm editing it, there we go. Because I was editing the actual image itself, 
it's not going to allow me to do that, but I can change. Let me see if I can do it from here. Show and explore. I bet you didn't see the same thing. Because I started to edit it. Yep. Because I started to edit it, it's not going to let me change the name. But what I was getting at is if I change the name here, it'll automatically get changed in here. So if you and if I were to drag images into Luminar, you know, if I drag them, I'm sorry, if I drag them into one of these folders from the operating system, it'll appear here. If I remove it, it'll be removed here. So there's no more of this, oh my God, Lightroom or Luminar lost by photos. And you realize that no, you just moved them out of the directory. So this is an active directory. So we could use it like that to where I could add folders of images. The second way we could use it, and you saw me do that, was use it as a Lightroom or a Photoshop plugin. And the third way, it just is a single image editor. So imagine if Josh came to the house and said, hey, here's a bunch of models that I took. I took these photos of um, these models. And he only wants to add one of them, for example. Let me come over here. And we'll go coffee break. And let's say he has this on his thumb drive. Here we go. He has it on his thumb drive, hands it to me. I open it up. Boom. It's on my computer. So it didn't move from his thumb drive. It's here. When I'm done with this, right click, remove single image editor. So now I don't have to store any of these images in my catalog. So that's what that's that's a really cool feature. So while we have her up, I did mention earlier about the cropping. And I never finished my thought on that. I apologize. So let's say we're going to crop the daylights out of this. And I personally like cropping parts of the head. All right. here. So there's the image. Let's get to it. All right. And it's cropped. All right. Template. I'm going to use one of mine that I created for it. And I believe it was called uh, Soulful maybe. Well, that's nice, but that wasn't the one I used. Uh, dreaming. Okay, that was it. Dreaming and Dreaming 3. All right, so let's say this is the edit we decided to go with. Oh, I like that. All right, so let's say this is the edit we decided to go with. Kevin, being the ruthless art director that he is, says to me, Vanelli, what are you, a rookie? Why'd you cut her head off? Oh, that's my style. Yeah, well, it looks stupid. I hate it. And that's waiting on that's not the way he talks so in the past look at that we'd have to go back through if this were photoshop and we cropped in the beginning all of those edits that we did over here we'd have to start all over again or if we waited to the end and we cropped it and then we realized oh shoot you know what um i wish i cropped it differently or i wish i added a different look to this so let, let's say Kevin gets his way, as usual. So Kevin gets his way, and remember rule Kevin. of thirds, my friend. There. Rule so here thirds. we are. He likes it. Boom. He likes it like this. However, he says to me, Vanilla, you know what though? That that dreaming one's not cutting it for me. That one I like much better. Boom. I could change it and not have it affect the crop that we just did. So what I'm getting at is gone are the traditional days of, and how many of us have done this in the past? Remember the old Jack, um, oh, Jack Davis's wow books, where right? you'd go through, and they had like 15 to 30 steps, and they're going through everything, and all of a sudden, you're like, here, click. Why doesn't mine look the same? Oh, be, <laughs> there it is, Kevin. You know, and then you go back to it, and you realize in step number four, you forgot to add something to it. 
that's a traditional way of, and it's so funny because we're the creative types. Aren't we the ones that do this? Squirrel, oh, squirrel, right? You're out there, you're all excited and, and you oh, look at that. So why are we doing analytical style editing? This is where you could start and end in any position you want. The cropping doesn't have to be start in the beginning. You can do it at the end or you can start at the beginning and finish off with other stuff at the end. Bottom line, the goal is for this to morph around you to where the AI kind of takes over and says, all right, we want, I want to emulate you. Tell me what you like. And after a while, you start doing all this stuff and you start to save little templates and things. You just have to come in, click, 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 done, and go on to something else. All right? So, Kevin, we're, we're right about out of time, are we not? Yeah, well, I wanted to say that book. Uh, I don't know why it's on my shelf. Uh, it has a copyright <laughs> of, of 1993. <laughs> um, actually, funny story. My uh, I don't know how many of you know Jack Davis. He's, he's pretty cool. He, he's from San Diego. My, my, uh, my wife was his TA at a, at a oh, college wow. here in town called Platt. She went from a fine art, very traditional painting, you know, hands-on type stuff and learned all the digital stuff over at Platt and it served her quite well. Oh, wow. Yeah, Jack Davis is one of the originals 20 something years ago. I give him, um, of course, Jimmy D. Fatale and a lot of them, I give a lot of them credit for helping me 20 plus years ago. You know, um, uh, Jimmy D.'s wife, Helene Glassman, even Kevin Ames, when he wrote the book, The Art of Photographing Women, I look at these guys down there, my colleagues, uh, Tony Corbell. I love Tony Corbell. When he says to me, oh my God, Vanilla, you taught me so much about Luminar or about Lightroom. I can't tell you how that makes me feel on the inside because he did 20 plus years ago, took me off to the side and actually taught me about metering in camera where other people were kind of mocking and they're just saying say stuff to me. He took the time out of it. And to me, those are true, truly educators. And, and if you have a chance of taking on an intern or an assistant, by all means, take them on because they want your knowledge. And in return, yes, they have to do certain things for you to kind of pay their dues. All right. So here is the, uh, the coupon code, correct, Kevin? Yeah, to, so you know we we've got a a little ten dollar off coupon code or ten euro or ten British pounds off of uh, Luminar AI. If you if you like what you see, um, if you think it might be a great addition to your toolkit, um, you can pick it up on our website uh, skylum.com, and then uh, use that coupon code uh, that Vanelli mentioned. I also put it in the chat. Uh, uh, you know, on the site there. So a couple of questions came up. Uh, Don asked, how much is Luminar AI? Um, it, the, the right answer is it depends. So uh, we just, uh, you know, for new for Luminar AI, we have a one seat or a two seat version. So the two seat version, which means you can um, uh, load it on a laptop or a desktop is uh, $99. Uh, this code will get it to you for 89. However, if you just have one computer that you work on, maybe you're just your desktop, uh, you can actually pick up the, the software for $79 and the $10 coupon off will make it uh, $69. Uh, Clay asked about scheduled upgrades. So the way we do scheduled upgrades, we're not a subscription service, it's considered a perpetual license. So the, the way we do upgrades uh, is that periodically during the year, we will release uh, support for new camera file formats, um, any bug fixes that come up. Uh, sometimes there's little tweaks and changes that we have to make in the, in the software. Um, but, uh, but also we'll, we'll include some features, uh, some new features for free. Uh, you, uh, Vanelli mentioned early on that, that coming up soon is a, is a brand new version of our Sky AI. It'll include some really cool features like uh, having the sky reflected on reflections or are reflected on um, water right? Including water with ripples. So it's, I've seen some of this, it's really astonishing. Later on in the year, we'll have Boca AI, which uses our depth mapping that he was talking about to, under, to isolate the foreground subjects from the background. 
and create a really pleasing uh, bokeh in the background. So those, uh, those are examples of free upgrades that people would get. When we go to a major version upgrade, and this is where we introduce a ton of new features, uh, probably make some interface tweaks based on you know, customer feedback, that's, that's generally um, moves away from the update what we call free updates into a true upgrade path. And, uh, and usually, you know, of course, people that have had the previous version of software, we can discount on it. So there was a question about CR3 files. That's uh, one of the relatively new file formats that, um, that's, that Canon's put out. Um, that's a file format that we will support very, very shortly, <laughs> very shortly. So, um, you know, there's there there's definitely a workaround right now. A lot of people are taking their CR3s into uh, DNG files, and then we fully support DNG. Uh, so so making that kind of round trip, but uh, but B and I will go on record uh, today saying that uh, CR3 will be uh, supported very soon. Awesome, and Kevin, here are some of the resources. You can see the resource they put up. Uh, you can check out Skylum.com. So. Skylum has made a strong commitment and dedication to education. So they made a strong commitment to it and a dedication to it, not just for you, the end user, but also we work in Kevin's part of this project. We want to get Luminar in every university, every uh, college and uh, the high schools, much like what Adobe did, uh, not Adobe, Mac did with the original um, Macs. We, we came back from uh, Texas, we were, we were in Houston, and they had the largest convention where all the top schools came in, and it was so cool to be able to just hand out, so how much does this cost? We're not selling it. How many, how many computers do you have in your lab? 30, okay, well, we'll put you down, and you'll have 30 seeds. Our goal is to teach and get it into the hands of the teachers um, to help the students. Now. With that being said, we also spent a lot of energy in the support, the user manual, and here's this insiders at skylum.com. That you're gonna love. We do do coffee break twice a day, like Kevin said. One day, one day, one part of the day is in insiders, the other part is in YouTube. The insider one is just like this, a Zoom to where you can ask questions and we're, we're in a meeting, not a webinar. And you'll be able to ask questions. We'll, we start out and we show five minutes of what the topic was on, was on. We quickly, in five minutes, give you the answer to the topic we talked about. And then the remainder 25 minutes, we end up spending just talking and answering questions that people may have. It could be on topic, it could be off topic, but it's usual, well, it has to be photography related. And then, of course, we're on all of your favorite um, social media channels. Does anybody uh, use social media anymore? <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, we've got, last couple, election. we've got a couple of questions uh, that I'll answer here. here so uh, Stephen asks, what is Luminar X? So Luminar X uh, is, is a, a membership service. It's a subscription service that provides exclusive uh, education and, um, and also add-ons to, to uh, Luminar AI that, uh, that are ordinarily for sale as individual units. So for, for a low monthly fee, you get, uh, again, exclusive education uh, and also things like skies and textures and LUTs and, and um, you know, augmented sky objects. And these are all exclusive to the, the Luminar X membership. It's really actually a, a pretty good deal um, and uh, I happen to know the project manager in charge of that. She's a wonderful woman and has been working for us for, uh, gosh, coming on five years now. And so she's really committed to expanding that program. Uh, as the partnerships and biz dev guy, um, I, uh, one of my goals this year is to bring in more partner deals and, and, uh, and complementary products to the, to the marketplace and to Luminar X. Um, there was a question from Jay Smith uh, about Capture One, and V, maybe maybe you and I can tag team on this. So, um, so the the official support 
uh, for uh, Luminar AI as a, running as a plugin is for Photoshop and, and Lightroom Classic. Um, there are ways to manually install into Photoshop Elements. And correct me here, V, I, there's a way to manually install it as an editing extension for Capture One as well. Is that true? Yes. Okay. But again, um, it's not supported. So don't, don't call support and say, you know, Vanelli and Kevin said, <laughs> right. Supported. right. They'll, um, they'll, they'll give you, they'll give you the instruction sheet to, to do it yourself. And, you know, honestly, um, we're, we're committed. I mean, we're kind of the, the outlier with the innovators who want to be the tip of the spear for a lot of these things. And frankly, you know, it makes great business sense and strategic uh, sense for us to, to play wherever photographers are. We know we're going to bring unique tools to, to photographers that they love. We're going to bring efficiencies to get to a result versus trudging through a process. And we want to make that available to people wherever they are. Um, I, I'm not going to uh, promise anything here or you know, go off the reservation uh, too far. But you know, we certainly have things like uh, mobile solutions you know, on, on, the, on the roadmap. Uh, we've got support for additional tools. Um, you know, I'm talking with a, a lot of business partners around the world. And so the future of, of Luminar AI as a platform is, is very bright. Um, I will tell you, and, and I've heard this uh, uh, in the past, not of course from this group, this is the first time we've, uh, we've seen you, but, um, you know, people ask about, you know, can they, can they trust an independent software developer? You know, are, are we as you know reliable? Are we as responsive? Are we going to be around five years from now? And and all I can say is, you know, we've been around since 2008. We've got a very committed group of uh, of people, and most of them are quite young. I I think I'm at 57. I think I'm probably the the oldest guy by at least five years of anybody in the company, including Mr. V. So so um, you know, I think the future is very very bright. Uh, we're committed to uh, the R and D necessary to maintain our, our innovation reputation on AI. And again, we'll continue to work with, uh, with as many partners and on as many platforms as we can. And, and, and Kevin, like we mentioned, it's a group of photographers. I mean, when, when yeah. we were in New York city, wasn't it cool that our CEO and Dima, you know, the, the co-founder and the guy who was writing this up is sitting in the booth answering questions. And one, one of the, the guys from Brooklyn, Comes over, I tell him, hey, I'm from New York. Really, where? Syracuse. Psst, that's not New York. That's how all these Brooklyn people act. So the Brooklyn guy pulled me up and said, hey, who are the two new guys? Those guys are really good. I go, new guys? That's our CEO. And that's the guy who actually created the software. He goes, no wonder they know this stuff inside and out. He goes, I'm impressed. I go, wow, so you got to work with them. I mean, how cool is that? Yeah. That good you friend. get to work with the CEO, or you know, the, the, the founder of the company. Um, I mean, Kevin, we've been around for a long time and, and I can't remember if I sat down with Thomas Knoll, you probably have, Thomas Knoll with Photoshop. You're gonna, I, I got a great story about that. Before Adobe bought Photoshop, the first company, I, I don't know how many Mac fans are still on the line here, but my first uh, job was with uh, Silicon Beach Software, which was a, a venerable first indie developer that, uh, it's just such a great company. Um, and uh, I think I was employee number seven. I was, you know, 22, 23. And um, I got a chance to really watch a very small company grow to be a decent size. And we got bought by, by uh, ultimately got bought by Aldous Corporation out oh, of wow. Seattle. Um, yeah, oh, the PageMaker guys, exactly right. And so we all had, you know, we had consumer gaming, we had a lot of consumer productivity and graphics products, including a product called Digital Darkroom, which I thought was the, the ultimate name for what we were doing. It was a photo editor back in 1988. Um, but all that, all that said, our reputation had been growing and the Knoll brothers actually, um, I was just a lowly product manager at the time, but the Knoll brothers brought Photoshop to Silicon Beach, um, uh, either slightly before or uh, at the same time as Adobe. And uh, it, it, was, it was interesting because our digital darkroom product was much more like a Lightroom uh, style product. Um, it was very 
sort of traditional photography base. So you didn't you didn't paint any colors on it. You applied tints to things, right? There were dodging and burning tools. And again, we're going back to grayscale times, right? And I I still remember our God. Don't tell him I said this. I still remember our CEO saying, uh, you know, uh, we're not we're not that interested in Photoshop. We've got our own super paint product, and and you know the future is grayscale. <laughs> oh my gosh but uh I, you know adobe would have outbid us anyway but it was fun to see the product uh that early in the game you know it was a obviously pre-release of it and and you know hats off to adobe they've done an amazing job at growing the the 800 pound gorilla I, I liken it to the u.s tax code you know you can only understand very small parts of it <laughs> But you're forced to use it every year. <laughs> um, we're we're in a completely different uh, different space at this point. So, uh, I'm uh, this is Clay, and I see that Josh, our president, has signed off to put his kids to bed. Uh, Patty Robertson, our vice president, I don't see online, so it may fall to me uh, to kind of thank you. Uh, profusely both of you for your time tonight thank you for the adjustment that you made to join us after we had our our big freeze last week we really appreciate you could you could come tonight and um, uh, put your comments in the um, uh, chat thing for the you know thank them for it we appreciate it I want to call on Mark to uh, tell us how the competition is coming for this weekend and if you've got enough judges Mark? Yes, I have judges um, and we're in good shape. I just need more entries. Uh, I think the frozen weather froze a lot of uh, shutter fingers, but uh, for the, uh, we, this, this month we sent off the advanced group to a, a PSA judge and they've already turned their, the winners in from the advanced group. So I want all you uh, beginners and our basic and intermediate photographers to send in your images uh, by deadline of midnight Saturday. Right. So the advanced class is already submitted and you had uh, judging by uh, the PSA judge, correct? Correct. Terrific. We'll look forward to that. Uh, I want to shout out to Verlin for also being the first person to suggest uh, Skylum as our program and that work has worked out really great. Thank you, Verlin. If you have other um, program ideas, speaker ideas, then uh, make sure that you send it to the um, club mailing address. And we don't actually have, a, we need a volunteer really to be our program coordinator. It, it would be a really stimulating uh, role for someone to take on one or two times to, to set up new programs. We have next month's program set. Uh, we'll have our first Thursday, of course, as being the critique meeting. Our third Thursday is always a program topic, and Mark, I think, has arranged for uh, Don to be our speaker. So it, I don't know if Don would like to say a few words of what you're planning. Still online, sure. Don? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Jay Maisel and uh, when he came out with a book on gesture to try to put things into context, I spent a great deal of time really trying to understand gesture and I came up with some ideas and then started putting that into my photography and then people would say how would you know to do that so then I started teaching because I do mostly teaching and lecturing I I uh, don't do too much shooting anymore um, and um, so I've got good reviews where I've taught it before so I thought well I'll offer it up if they're interested fine if not and I sent uh, Mark about 40 or so different types of lectures and workshops that I've taught over the years. So it's more like I don't know the group very well. So it's kind of understanding what people are really interested in needs are and at what level do you teach it at. Um, so this will be my first venture into this, but I'm looking forward to it. Oh boy, we're looking forward to it too. Absolutely. That sounds like a fantastic topic. I mean, Jay is uh, such an amazing individual. <laughs> v, I know you know him as well. Uh, uh, and I'm, I just, I, I had honestly, I had to start looking up uh, what he meant by gesture, you know, just to make sure it was clear in, in my head. And, and right on the site here, 
you know, he talks about, it, you know, it being the, the narrative, the expression at the heart of what, what people shoot. So it's that's going to be a fantastic, feel. it's going to be a fantastic. Kind of about uh, what you feel more than yeah. what you see. But yep. it's interesting. I always wanted to take a class from him because he's housed in New York City, of course. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about this so you get an idea because he's like 89 years old right now and doesn't teach, but he charges $5,000 a week for his workshops. You pay for transportation, lodging, and meals. His, his workshops start every day at seven o'clock in the morning. They end about 10 o'clock at night. Um, even though I had a son that lives in Manhattan, I still thought it was a little pricey for what I wanted to spend to be with him. But I have got his, all his books and I've seen several video type things that he's been involved with. and. He's an impressive guy and he, he shoots almost everything inside the boroughs in New York City. And he can often be found like I might carry an iPhone in my pocket. He's got his old Nikon with a 70 to 300 lens on it. And that's what he does all the shooting. He's amazing with some of his work. So now, now Tom, you're not going to use his language though, right? <laughs> I, no, I'm, I'm kind of, you'll probably be boring because I'm too clean cut. No, no, yeah. So Jay, Jay and I, um, we actually go way back. Believe it or not, I was my former career was martial arts, um, and Jay was in the martial arts back in the '60s. Mm -hmm. So my brother was the undefeated heavyweight champion in the '70s, and then I was a triple crown champion in the '80s. So the Vanelli name spanned, and so here's Jay thinking, "Wow, you look great for being so." And he didn't realize it was my brother John. In that era, um, and that used to always be hard. Like you fight this huge guy, and he goes, "Oh, good luck, John." You're like, "Oh crap!" He thinks I'm my, I'm, my, I'm my brother, um, you know. So, but that's how Jay and I actually bonded through the martial arts, and of course, the photography. He took my son out on a photo shoot instead of me, and I was like, "What the heck?" You know, I don't know if I was happy as a father or ticked off as a photographer, you know. And he's ah. You 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 still got time in you. I want to spend time with him, and he took him off, and just did this little photo shoot. And I thought that was the coolest. He came back calling him Uncle Jay. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, everything was born for me. I, I read the book. I was interested in it, exploring it a little bit, and I belonged to a uh, a faith based photography group outside of Austin, and we kind of came together and said, you know, one of the things we see as a problem globally is that language gets in the way because two people can read the same sentence and walk away with completely different meanings. What, what can we do to tell a better story inside our photos? So I use that as a springboard to say, let's, let's find a way to add that special sauce to things and how, and really it's teaching you how to feel it's teaching you how to see. And so, I, I might I might tell the story if I remember it, but I used to run field trips for a couple of years, and um, we would get back in the car after we were in a field trip, and I knew within five seconds somebody was going to say, "So how many photos did you take today?" And the person next to him would say, well, "I took 500," and he'd say, "God, oh my, what happened? You didn't find good stuff to shoot it? I took over 700." So I sit silent, and at the end of the thing, they say, "Well, Mr. Simpson." How many photos did you take? And I said, you know, I don't really don't count them, but maybe 75. And he, they said, oh, you really had a bad day. I said, no, I spent my time finding four or five things that were going to be dynamite. I walked around them. I laid down. I climbed a tree. I found the shot that I wanted. And you'll just have to wait when we do the wrap up and you judge for yourself. Because they got the old Ansel Adam tripod holes. One person would take a shot. They get up, the next person puts their tripod there, and I'm like, I'm not taking that picture. Everybody's already got it. So anyways, it, it's, it's fun, it's light. It's not a lot of technology being pushed at you. It's looking at pictures and talking about why, why they're maybe different. And there are some that are gonna be just what I'll call, they're all my photos, but they're not intended to be, in, in every case, my best photos. They're intended to, to be able to say something I'm trying to say to demonstrate what it is. And sometimes in classes, I'll have students, 
I'll, I'll just have a table over in the corner with a chair and maybe a flashlight laying on it and say, okay, now you've learned all about gesture. There's that table and chair over there. Shoot, there's gesture and everything. I've never had a person pick up the flashlight and use it until I show them that just being able to throw shadows up against different types of walls and things, I can do amazing work. Uh, so you can take still lifes and things and you can add something to it that says more than most people. So you're not doing happy snappies or drive-by shootings or whatever I call, you know, call them or just bing, I got another one, I got another one. You really spend time with the wow. photos. So we're going to look like forward to that. Fascinating. That'll be yep. the third Thursday. Um, I'm going to, unless there are any other uh, members who want to make a quick announcement or anything like that about their work, anybody, I will adjourn the meeting and just remind everybody to go by the coffee shop, the West, uh, West Pecan coffee shop in downtown Pflugerville. Take a look at the show that's been hung. But if uh, we are now adjourned, and we, once again, we thank our speakers, uh, Mark LaRue, Kevin LaRue and um, Robert Benelli. Thank you so much from Skylar Thanks. Software. Thanks, folks. Thank, thank you. A, it's been a, a distinct pleasure. Take care. Have a great night.